We are in a series where we're talking about people who were looking for a savior. And they're kind of, I really want to challenge myself and just kind of talk about some of the characters that we typically don't talk about in the nativity story. The problem is, sometimes there's just not a lot of information about that. There's a reason why we don't talk a lot about them in the nativity story. But we're looking at some people that are kind of on the peripheral, if you will. They're mentioned in the Bible, but they have this one thing in common. They were searching for a savior. Last week we talked about John the Baptist and he sent word to Jesus, are you the one we're waiting for or should we expect another? And the wise men who traveled from afar and they came and they were searching for a savior. The shepherds, the night Jesus was born, the angels appeared to them. They go into Bethlehem and they were searching for a savior. Today's character we know so little about and some of what we know comes from Luke's telling of the story. So we're going to land in Luke's gospel. If you got your Bible open up to Luke chapter two, I'm gonna use a couple of other places to set some context because I want you to understand what's happening in the story before we get to Luke chapter two. To do that, we're gonna to go to an Old Testament book called Exodus, and it's about the exit. It's about the children of Israel that were leaving slavery in Egypt, and, and God was delivering them out into freedom, and they would, they would then become their own homeland. This is the night before the march. This is the night before they would actually leave. And so I'm gonna read in Exodus chapter 13. God, through his prophet Moses, is giving this message to Israel. Exodus chapter 13, verse 11. It says, this is what you must do when the Lord fulfills the promise he swore to you and to your ancestors. When he gives you the land where the Canaanites now live, you must present all firstborn sons and firstborn male animals to the Lord for they belong to him. Okay, what happened in, in the book of Exodus, you can read this, there was this 10 plagues and the last final plague was the death angel would pass over. And throughout the land of Egypt, all of the firstborn sons, all the firstborn male animals, if you had not followed the Lord's instruction and painted the blood of the lamb over your doorpost, all of the firstborn sons in Egypt were killed. Israel was saved from this. They sacrificed a lamb and that lamb was a substitute, if you will, and, and when you, the reason for painting the blood over the door is like, hey, we did what you asked to, we substituted. And so that's why he was saying, listen, you need to make a sacrifice in the place for your sons to redeem them because they should have died in the plague in Egypt. And then he gives some instruction, verse 13, a firstborn donkey, it may be bought back from the Lord by a substitute, you can place a lamb or a young goat in its place. But if you don't, then you need to break its neck. And then he makes a statement, however, you must buy back every firstborn son. Like some of y'all got kids, like you mean that's a thing, like I could break its neck? No, the Bible is clear, you cannot. You need to buy back. And there's an offering prescribed for buying back that firstborn son. Why? Because it should have died in the Passover, okay? Verse 14, and in the future. So this is not a one-night deal. This is something that God wanted the children of Israel to use for future generations to teach them about their redemption, to teach them what God did that night. So verse 14, and in the future, your children will ask you, Daddy, why do we do that? Daddy, what does all of this mean? And then he's like, you need to teach them. You need to tell them with the power of his mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, the place of our slavery, okay? One more passage. It's found in the book of Leviticus. And I know when you think the Christmas story, you think Leviticus, right? Hashtag me too, right? you know what I'm saying? All right, so Leviticus chapter 12, verse one. The Lord said to Moses, again, God's speaking to the children of Israel through his prophet Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If a woman becomes pregnant and she gives birth to a son, she will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. And on the eighth day, the boy must be circumcised. After 33 days, she will be purified from the bleeding of childbirth. I wanna jump down to verse six. When that time, or when the time of purification is completed, after that seven days and then 33 days, the woman must bring a one-year-old lamb, lock that in your memory, for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for the purification offering. 
She must bring her offerings to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle. The priest will then present them to the Lord to purify her. Then she will be ceremonially clean again. If a woman cannot afford to bring a lamb, she must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for the burnt offering, the other for the purification offering. The priest will sacrifice them to purify her and she will then be ceremonially clean. What in the world does that have to do with sweet little baby Jesus, right? What I've read to you are two very important Jewish laws surrounding childbirth, okay? And they're are what the Jewish culture calls mitzvahs. And we're a little familiar with the term mitzvah. Maybe you've seen on TV or maybe you're friends with Jewish people or whatever. And when a boy becomes of age or a young woman becomes of age, the boy has a bar mitzvah. The girl has a bat mitzvah. Mitzvah means it's a command. Okay, it's a ritual that has been commanded by the Lord. And so there are several mitzvahs in what I've just read in both Exodus and Leviticus. The night before the exodus of Egypt, God is saying, listen, your firstborn should die in this plague, but because I've given you a way to redeem them, and I want you to do this forever, because this will serve as a reminder, parents, don't forget to teach your kids what God has done for you in your life. By the way, that still holds true in 2022. Can I get an amen? For the ages, this needs to be a reminder. Future generations are going to ask, why do we have to do this again? This is so old-fashioned. Oh my goodness, that was so long ago. Listen, this is a teaching moment for you to tell them the story of how God redeemed Israel with his mighty right arm. It's the same reason why we take communion. It is a reminder for the ages. The second passage, which was out of Leviticus is the purification after childbirth, okay? God, again, through his prophet Moses, is giving instructions on the offering or the sacrifice that's to be made after a mother gives birth. And because of that process, because of all the bleeding and so on and so forth, she would deemed under Jewish law, she would be unclean. Well, now you have to make a sacrifice so that they can label you or name you as clean again. There's three ceremonies in those passages we talked about, two of them, require offerings. Three ceremonies, two of them require an offering. The first ceremony is when the boy is eight days old, it's the circumcision. It's to be performed at the temple, the tabernacle, at the synagogue by the rabbi. The second ceremony, and this includes an offering. The first one does not. This one includes an offering, and it is what's called in Jewish culture the pidyon haben, The Pijan Haven, it's the offering of redemption. My son should have died on the Passover. And so I am redeeming him. I'm buying him back, if you will. And that is called the Pijan Haven. By the way, in the 1970s, the Israeli bank um, minted some specific coins. It's it's the equivalent of five coins. And uh, they have on there, and it's, it's, it's it's basically equal to $75 today in our economy. And these coins have become kind of rare. You can Google it. You can still buy them too. But these um, Pidyon Haben coins, all right? The third ceremony, it also includes an offering. And it is a, what we would call a writ or a ritual of purification for the mother after she has given birth to either a boy or a girl. Doesn't matter what gender your child was, you had to go through this ritual of purification, all right? You're gonna, the reason why I show you this in the Old Testament, you're gonna see all three of these, and I wanna just kind of slow down, take some time and unpack them because you're gonna see them in our story today with our character who is searching for a savior. So I wanna go to Luke chapter two. If you got your Bible, that's where we're gonna camp in Luke's telling of the nativity. I'm gonna start with verse seven, and it just says this, all right? It says, she gave birth. The reason why I put that up there is she gave birth. So Jesus has been born. The angels appear to the shepherds. The shepherds come to this barn in Bethlehem, if you will, and they see the Messiah. They see the Christ child has been born. And now I want to jump to verse 21. Luke 2, verse 21 says, then eight days later. So eight days later from that verse 7, she gave birth eight days later. When the boy was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given to him by the angel before he was conceived. And so I know when you're sitting down and you're just, you're reading this maybe in your quiet time or maybe reading the Christmas story together, it just goes really fast. 
you know, you go from birth into eight days later, he was circumcised. But what I want you to see, the reason I'm hitting pause here, verse 21 is its own isolated event. It's a standalone. Baby Jesus was eight days old. Most likely, according to the way Luke tells the story, they took him to the synagogue in Bethlehem if there was one. And more than likely there was. Each Jewish town had a place of worship. So they probably took him to the synagogue in Bethlehem. The rabbi named him, which the parents always would tell the rabbi, we're calling him. And then the rabbi would also perform the circumcision, okay? It's possible, not likely, but it's possible his binyan had been would have happened there where they would have redeemed him. But the story doesn't read that way. It reads that this takes place later in the story. So keep in mind, Luke 21, eight days later, they took him, he was circumcised. That's its own standalone event. Verse 22 begins with the words, then, meaning this is now another event. It's not the same day. The math doesn't add up. Okay, so verse 21, eight days after he was born, he went to be circumcised. Then in verse 22, then it was the time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses, which we read after the birth of the child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And honestly, in, in, in the translation, stuff, if, where that semicolon is at, if they would have stopped and put a period and honestly made another verse, it would have made it a little more clear. But in verse 22, there are actually two ceremonies going on there. There are two separate events that are happening. Luke goes quickly, right? And so there's two things that happen. We saw those in Exodus and Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 12. The woman will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. On the eighth day, the boy is circumcised. Then after waiting 33 days, she will be, pur pur she will be purified from the bleeding of childbirth. So there's seven days, eight days, 33 days. Ah! You have to slow down. Verse 21 is the eight-day circumcision, all right? Verse 22 happens 40 days after. So she's unclean for seven days, then after 33 days, then she would go to the temple, she would make the sacrifice, and the priest would declare her now clean again. So Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, then on the 40th day, Mary would go to the temple, and it's on that day, that's when they actually would do the Pinyon Hibin, that they would take Jesus to the temple, all right? So they leave Bethlehem, where he was born. They travel to Jerusalem, a little over five U.S. miles to get there. Mary's ceremonially purified, and Jesus is what we call the presentation of the temple. They brought Jesus in, and they did, most likely here is where the uh, Pinyon Hibin takes place in this moment. Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> Look at your neighbor, ask him, are you all right? Because I know sometimes history gets a little bit swirly. Everybody okay? All right, wake them up. I forgot to tell the ladies in the coffee shop, make it a double shot of espresso this morning, you know? All right, verse 23. The law of the Lord says if a woman's first child is a boy, then there's a whole different thing that takes place. He must be dedicated to the Lord. Okay, it goes back to what we read in Exodus. Okay, you need to redeem that child because he should have died in the Passover. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. With careful study, you would see that Luke was very selective in what scripture he quotes, because up on the screen, it's in quotation marks, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, okay? What we saw in Exodus chapter 12, now it's interesting, because Exodus chapter 12 said the family and to redeem their firstborn son needs to be a one-year-old lamb. But Luke doesn't mention a one-year-old lamb. But Exodus 12 also says if they could not afford a lamb, they could bring turtle doves and young pigeons. So Mary and Joseph had endured great expense traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And the lodging that's required and feeding their animals and feeding themselves and whatever they may need for the birth of a child... And then not only do they travel from Bethlehem, now they travel to Jerusalem. How many of you know trips are expensive? Every time you stop at the gas station, it's just $47. If you let the kids go in, it's not good. They do not give the one-year-old lamb. Instead, they give two turtle doves and two young pigeons the offering that was described for poor people. 
for those who were, if you, it says if you can't afford a one-year-old lamb, you can do this. Sidebar, not to throw you off the thought train, but this is why we think the wise men that came from afar, this is why we think they came not when Jesus was born, but they came after the fact. You know, the song says, a child, a child, shivers in the cold. I mean, if I was writing the song, I'd have said, let us give him a blanket. <laughs> but instead, they piled a bunch of gold on him. I'd be fine with that too. You know what I'm saying? If you don't throw some gold on your brother. The gifts that the wise men brought would have been enough to buy easily a one-year-old lamb. So this right here, this is the reason why we don't think that the wise men didn't come till later. Jesus was at least a year old, maybe two, and there's some other conversation that goes into that. But Jesus wasn't born in a palace. Jesus wasn't even born into a middle-class family. Jesus wasn't born into wealth. He born into a family that, according to this story, was financially struggling. They could barely afford the travels that this adventure required. They could barely afford the minimum offering required by law. Jesus, as a young child, knew what it was like to struggle. But man, I just, this is one of those things that as I unpacked this, I just kept circling here and kept circling here. I even called Pastor Matt. I'm like, I need to chew on this because there's something here. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to dig it out. What if, what if Mary and Joseph's financial situation where they could not at least afford a one-year-old lamb, what if their financial situation where we can only pay the minimum offering, we can't afford the lamb? What if it was their financial situation that created space where there was no confusion who the real lamb of God was at the temple that day? There was no lamb used to redeem the lamb of God. There would be no substitute lamb for our Savior. That's really good, Brent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> maybe what you're going through, maybe the season of struggle that you're in is setting you up to bring some clarity to your life. Maybe God's wanting you to have that wow moment in your struggle, in your trial, in your season. You could only afford the minimum. And God doesn't want you to be confused about who the real Lamb of God is. The thing that you're going through right now is what God wants to use to show you that he is your provider and he is your Lamb. If they would have been rich, they wouldn't have seen the Savior, they would have seen the substitute Lamb. So now we meet our character that I wanna dive into and, and talk about. His name, you would say it in English, as Simeon, it can also be referred to as Shimon, which is a, a common Hebrew name. And he is a character who has been searching for a savior. I'm gonna jump to Luke chapter two, verse 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit of the Lord led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. Stranger danger. He takes the child into his arms and prays God like, give me that baby. I don't know you, you crazy old coot. What are you doing? That's just what is going on here, right? He took the child into his arms and he praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you've promised. Mamas, just imagine that moment. Like this guy takes his baby and like, Lord, you can kill me now. I'm like what? I have seen your salvation, which you've prepared for all people. He is light to reveal God to the nations. He is the glory of all your people of Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined. Mark that in your memory. This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, yet others will rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of your heart, the deepest thoughts of many hearts, people that say they're religious, people think they love God, but their hearts are gonna be revealed then he looks right at Mary and he says, a sword will pierce your very soul. 
Simeon the singing prophet. He's known by several names in church history, one of which is Simeon Senex, S-E-N-E-X. It's Latin for old man. Simeon Senex, Simeon the old man. And so from here on out, we're gonna refer to Pastor Joe as Joe Senex. Just... <laughs> he also has a <laughs> He also has a name. <laughs> Simeon Theodocus was also Latin for God receiver. Because that's what he did at the temple. This, this old man just comes in and he makes this proclamation over Jesus. Story goes in the 1940s in South Side of Chicago, there was an older man and the people just called him Indian Joe. They don't know if he was Indian and they don't know if his name was actually Joe. That was just what the people called him was Indian Joe. And he spent the majority of his days outside, sometimes just kind of wandering the community. Sometimes Indian Joe would wander in the street and would just kind of direct traffic. Not that it needed to be directed, it's just what he felt needed to be done. And so Indian Joe would be the target of people's ridicule. The rumors, the jokes. Indian Joe was crazy. Not a lot on the internet you can find about Indian Joe. It just one day he was never seen again. I think most towns have at some point their version of an Indian Joe. Maybe you were thinking of the one that was in your town. Someone that most people in the town think they might just be a little, little bit off. I, I wonder, I wonder if in first century Jerusalem, what did those people think about Simeon? An older man often visited the temple. Imagine those conversations. What are you, what are you doing, Simeon? Just looking for the Messiah. We all are, Simeon. Yeah, but the Lord told me I'd see him before I die. Okay, buddy. Oh, you're back again, Simeon. What are you doing? You looking for the Messiah? Yep, the Lord told me I would see him before I die. Well, you better hurry up, Simeon. <laughs> you're very stricken in age. You're getting on up there, buddy. But I think Simeon could relate to Abraham because God had promised Abraham he would give him his son and Abraham had to wait for 25 years to see that son be born. I think Simeon could relate to Noah. God said, Noah, it's gonna flood. You better build a boat. Noah went to work, took him years to build a boat and eventually that first raindrop fell. I think Simeon could relate to David. When David was just a boy, he was anointed as king and it would be years before he would see that promise. Why is it the theme of God's promises is many times followed with silence? Simeon was convinced he had heard from God. Simeon was convinced God's spirit had spoken to him. You will not die until you see the Savior. Simeon had spent the later part of his life searching for the Savior. Maybe he would be the recipient of people's ridicule. We really don't know. Luke describes him as a very righteous, a very devout man. He eagerly was awaiting the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. Some people think Simeon, actually, this is not in the Bible. This is as you get into church history and you kind of do some studying there. Some people think it's quite possibly that this Simeon in the Bible is a guy by the name of Simeon ben Hillel. In Hebrew, when you see Ben, B-E-N, it's not a name. It's really kind of a surname. It means son of, okay? So many people think that Simeon ben Hillel means that he would have been the son of Hillel. And we don't know a lot about this historical character named Simeon ben Hillel other than he was an important leader in the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was kind of the ruling religious class of Jerusalem. They kind of oversaw all of the Jewish religion and the, the rituals and things that went on with that. Simeon ben Hillel was the father of a guy by the name of Gamaliel ben Hillel. Gamaliel, we do know a little bit about, okay? Because Gamaliel ben Hillel is mentioned twice in the Bible. The first time he's mentioned in Acts chapter five, a couple of disciples had been arrested. A couple of disciples were on trial. The Sanhedrin was trying to decide if we should kill them. And Gamaliel steps up on the scene and he says, oh, Jerome. He said, if these guys, if this move of Jesus really is real, we don't wanna go on record as being against a move of God. If this is not real, it's gonna go away anyway, so why don't we just let him go and let him be in peace? That was Gamaliel. Later on in Acts chapter two, 
Paul gives him credit, and Paul says, listen, I sat at the feet of the scholar Gamaliel. So twice we have this Gamaliel ben Hillel mentioned in Scripture. Now, this is not biblical record. Don't be, look, where did he get that? What book is about that? No, 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 I'm talking about history, church history. He thinks it's quite possible that this Simeon ben Hillel was the father of Gamaliel is also the same Simeon that's at the temple that day. And, and it would make sense then why Gamaliel would actually at one point, he would kind of defend the disciples of Jesus because maybe he remembers the story that his old man father told him, man, there was a day at the temple when I don't know, God had sent me up there and I held that baby and I felt like something was going on in that moment. Maybe that's why Gamaliel said, hey, let's just let these guys be in peace. It's possible. And then this older man takes baby Jesus and he holds him against his chest and he begins to sing this beautiful song for the ages. And actually part of his song that he sings, he's actually quoting Isaiah chapter 52, verse 10. I won't go there, but if you're a side note taker and you wanna see that, he actually, in this song, he sings part of Isaiah chapter 52, 10, which again is reference to we're searching for a savior. So the things about Simeon's life and Simeon's story is number one, Simeon has this song of worship. He has this intimate moment of worship right there in the temple while he's holding the Christ child. I have read the gospels numerous times. I've lived through 48 Christmases. I've never known this. Part of lack on my absence of study, I guess. But there's actually four songs of the nativity that are found in scripture. And Luke records all four of them. I put this in your notes. If you're a note taker, you'll see that there. I didn't want you to have to worry about trying to spell all of these words and so on and so forth. So I, I just kind of saved you some time and wrote them. And all of these titles, the Latin named them. So that's why they don't really have necessarily English titles. The first song that Luke records is Mary's song. And it's the first, and I'm just gonna go chronologically in, in the scripture story. Luke chapter one, verse 46 through 55. That's Mary's song called the Magnifica. Magnifica. Like it looks like magnific magnificent, but it's not, it's magnificent. And that's again, the Latin spelling of it, okay? The second song is Zachariah's song and it is, the, the Latin name for it is Benedictus, okay? You see that in Luke chapter one, verse 68. The third song is the song that the angels would sing. And we sing a Christmas hymn that has this part in it. It's called Gloria in Excelsis. That's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 14. The fourth song is found right here in our story today, Simeon's Song. Now, the New Living doesn't say it that way. Simeon just says he held the baby and he praised God. But Luke really records this as a song. Simeon's song is called the Nunc Dimittis. Nunc Dimittis. And it's found, obviously, in this passage we're looking at in Luke chapter 2. Nunc Dimittis. It means, the name of this means now release. And here's why. When, when you take that first sentence of what Simeon is saying, Nunc Dimittis servium tum Domine, and I am not fluent in Latin. I was faking that, okay? But that's, if you take what he says, you translate that into Latin, it, that translates, now dismiss your servant, O Lord, okay? And so the first two words of that, nu dimittis. And by the way, in some of the Eastern Orthodox, this is a very important song. They sing it, some very devout Eastern Orthodox, they sing this every night, it's that kind of song. It's left that kind of legacy in church history. This is what he sings. Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you've promised. I've seen your salvation. I'm holding him right here in my arms, which you've prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of your people, Israel. The point of the song, Lord, you have fulfilled your promise. You told me I would see the Messiah and here I'm holding him in my arms. I am not crazy. Almost, almost titled this message, you're not crazy. That's the point of this song is Lord, I have seen him. You have fulfilled your promise in my life. Now, come get your boy. Let me go home, let me die. So tomorrow actually marks the second anniversary of doing my grandfather's funeral. I went and pulled his funeral up to reference something and I realized that tomorrow would be the two-year mark and 
My dad died 20 years ago, and so my grandfather was really influential in my life in, in those later years, and he lived to be 91. He was, a, he was an elderly gentleman. Both of my grandparents lived a very full life. They were married for 68 years. Let that sink in. 68 years. And there's a picture of them, you know, they, as they got older, they were able to travel. And I know you're looking at them and go, well, we know where you get your good looks. Oh, stop. I didn't think it was that funny. <laughs> my grandmother passed away in October of 2014. My grandfather had to live another six years. And he grieved and he grieved. And I would go stay with him and, you know, I would hear him in his bedroom and he would be praying at night, and I could, I could hear him in, in his prayer was, God, just come get me. Let me just go to sleep and come get me. One day we were down at Daisy, and my granddad was telling a story. I don't really have to include that last part he was telling a story, because if you knew Bill Kellogg, it was just assumed if he was talking, he was telling a story. And we were down at the shop, and, and he was, Landon and I were down there, and he, he started to tell a story about somebody he saw the other day. He said, oh, I was at so-and-so's funeral, and I saw, and he stopped, and he goes, you know, about all I do is go to funerals anymore. And in that moment, I borrowed a line from the comedian Mark Lowry. And I said, well, you better hurry up or they're going to think you didn't make it. <laughs> he didn't think that was very funny. <laughs> I got a kick out of it. And he was at that point in his life. And he would oftentimes ask me, his favorite grandchild, the pastor. <laughs> Y'all think I'm lying. <laughs> to prove a point, I feel needs to validate my story, Pastor Will. After I did my grandmother's funeral, a lady walked up to me. She came up and she said, you know, every time your grandma showed us pictures, she always said, but this one's my favorite. <laughs> Hashtag just saying. There are four other cousins that can validate this story for you. I'm just he was in the hospital in Oklahoma City, and um, he had fluid around his heart. And what's funny is he, he died in December 9th, somewhere in there, and at Thanksgiving, he and I were talking about taking another trip because as the favorite, I would be the only one to ever take him anywhere. And uh, he was in the hospital, and my brother happened to be in the room at the time, and, and he passed. He died. And all the alarms started going off and beeping. They came in, and they were working on him, and they, they got, him, got him back. And after he kind of came out of this fog and came to, he was like, well, what happened? And my brother said, well, you, you died. Well, what'd you bring me back for? Like, seriously, he was mad. <laughs> brother was ready to go. He did. He lived a long, full life. And I, I relate Simeon to that story. I wondered that every day did he come to the temple looking for the Messiah because maybe he had lost his wife too. Just like my granddad, he had buried one of his sons. Maybe in, 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 in this song, this Nunc Dimitida, Sovereign Lord, now release me. Simeon had the promise of the Lord. He held him in his arms as the Savior, and his heart was searching for that Savior. It turns into this beautiful moment of worship. This song had been sang through the ages and still is. Secondly, in Simeon's moment, we see Simeon. Simeon has a unique name for Jesus. Jesus has lots of names, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us. He doesn't know Jesus' name, but he walked into this. And even how he describes or how Luke describes this story. And the New Living Translation, verse 25, just says that Simeon was looking for the Messiah. You miss that. But with careful study, and I always try to go back and, and look at older translations because I want to make sure that I don't miss anything because sometimes for the ease of understanding, we will take words and, and we'll just like Messiah because we'll, we'll, that's really what he's after. But yet there's a different word that's used here the word in verse 25 is actually the consolation of Israel. It says that he was looking for the consolation from the root word console or the comforter. He was looking for the consoler, the comforter of Israel. He was waiting on the one who would bring peace to God's people. 
Jesus would be the great consoler for Mary and Martha at Lazarus' tomb when he had died. He would be the great consoler for the adulterous woman that had been caught in the act by the religious zealots. He would be the great consoler to Thomas, the doubting disciple, as Thomas sat in disbelief that Jesus had died. And Simeon knew that. And he said he is waiting for the great consoler, the person who would bring comfort to generations. He would bring consoler to you and I. In this life, you will have troubles. But it's Jesus' word that says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. What a beautiful, powerful, and fitting title for the Messiah. Amen, everybody. And then Simeon says this. Simeon blessed them. He sang the song about Jesus. And then he blessed them. And he said to Mary, the baby's mother, the child is destined. The child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many other to rise. He's been sent from God. He's a sign from God. But many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. People that say they're spiritual, people pretend to put on the spiritual growth, the stuff, people that go to church, they act spiritual, but their heart is going to be revealed that they're after self-glory, not the glory of God. And then he says this right to Mary, a sword will pierce your very soul. This is Simeon's prophecy. I call him Simeon the singing prophet. He will call some to find life because Jesus is the way, truth, and the life. Jesus will also call many others to fall. There would be many that would reject Jesus because he did not meet their expectations. He met every biblical expectation. He fulfilled every biblical prophecy, but he just didn't meet their expectations. Well, the Messiah wouldn't come from a poor family who couldn't even pay the offering price to redeem their firstborn son. The Messiah wouldn't come to the defense of an adulterous woman. The Christ, he he wouldn't be seen with sinners and tax collectors. And there are many who would reject Jesus and it would lead them to fall, meaning it would lead them to an eternity in hell because they would not receive the message of the Messiah. But then there would be those who would there would be those who would rise. And he looks right at Mary and he says, a sword will pierce your very soul. This is a beautiful, precious moment of this baby being presented at the temple. Verse 33 says, Jesus' parents were amazed. They were amazed at what he was saying. This is kind of a wow moment. Confirmation after confirmation after confirmation after from the angel to the shepherds, to this man in the temple who holds their baby, confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. And then he prophesies to Mary about the emotions that she will feel someday standing at the foot of the cross. He's a precious baby now, but he would someday be crucified as a criminal. And Mary, you'll be there to see it all. The pain, the grief, the sorrow, I'm sure there were times that Mary even questioned, God, where are you at in this? Like, I didn't volunteer for this. I was just a young, unmarried girl. God, I don't have the strength to go through the pain. I'm not strong enough to go through the grief of having this soul pierced through my heart, watching my son being crucified as a criminal. And Simeon's prophecy would be fulfilled as Jesus cried out, it is finished as he breathed his last breath on the cross. And he told her that was coming. The world was searching for a savior. I think the most powerful part of this story, this was the part that I just, wow. I could take three or four Sundays and just impact these next four words. This most intimate moment is found right here, verse 34. And it says, this child is destined. There's a lot of theology there in those four words. Meaning Jesus was not an afterthought. Jesus was not plan B. And there is crazy grace found in God's love. Let me unpack that for you. Because what he's saying right here is there is crazy grace found in God's love. 
God has never been surprised by the actions of humanity. Disappointed? Yep. Angered? Yep. Wanted to start over? Yep. But God's never been surprised. Meaning when he breathed life into this clump of dirt and Adam became, and he formed life into Eve, he did so knowing they would eat the fruit. It was not. Dang it, Adam, I told you not to. What are you doing down there? Oh, Jesus, man, I'm sorry, buddy, but you're gonna have to go down there and fix Adam's mess up. Mm -mm. God knew Adam and Eve would sin and he made them anyway. Jesus was destined. You tie that with the theology found in John that says in the beginning he always was. Jesus was destined. God knew you would sin and he made you anyway. God knew you would struggle. And he loves you anyway. This baby was destined to be our Savior. Hey, thanks for watching this sermon on our Hillspring YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, take just a moment, hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single thing. Secondly, if this message has impacted you and you want to help reach others, visit our website at hillspring.tv. Hit that Give Now button to help us carry the hope of Christ around the world. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.